Hello, everybody, and welcome to um, our, our section of the Dean's Honor Symposium. Um, our, our group um, has organized uh, a series of presentations around the idea of, of body language and the question of the, the relationship of the body to language uh, and vice versa. Um, thinking a lot about how language uh, communicates about the body, but also about how the body itself is a, a medium of communication, uh, announcing style, status, trauma, and desire, uh, both to the, to the wider world, um, but also to the, uh, to the occupants of the body it's them, it themselves. Um, this way that the, the body sort of communicates to the, uh, the mind, if you, if you will. Um, so we're going to hear today uh, five presentations. Um, the, the cohort consists of, uh, and this is the order of presentation, uh, we're going to hear from Liv Corman, we're going to hear from Crystal Ellington, Eric Osowski, Emma Jones, and Art Lahara. Um, and first we're going to begin with uh, Liv Corman's presentation on the work of Claude Cahoon and Marcel Moore. Hi, I just wanna um, thank you all for coming, uh, for tuning in. Um, I just wanna start by introducing Claude Cahun and Marcel Moore. Um, so they were surrealist artists and writers who were romantic partners and often collaborated on projects together. They practiced photography, collage, and writing in Paris during the 1920s and 30s. They then moved to Jersey in Britain and continued working until Cahun's death in 1954. Um, in 1930, they published Disavals, a surrealist memoir that included their photo collages, such as this one and the one on the previous screen uh, slide. Um, their collages were published alongside the text in Disavals. Um, sorry, M Moore and Cahun sourced their own photography as reference materials for their collages. The couple only published their writings and collages during their lifetimes. Um, however, the most well-known works are their portraits, not their collages. Their photographs were published after Moore's death in 1972. This, in this large collection of surrealist photographs, Cahun is often the subject and Moore the photographer. Um, so this is an example of one of their most well-known works. Um, and the subject in this is Claude Cahun. And um, this is another example of one of their, their portraits. Um, and when their private archives were resurrected by art historians in the 1980s and 90s, Cahun was resurrected as the lesbian artist and more recently as a tra trans non-binary artist. These intimate photographs play with gender, age, and occupation to construct different identities and bodies. Um, so for my project, um, I made a zine titled Expansive slash Expensive Selfies um, that combines art historical analysis with collages using Gehun and Moore's portraits. I titled the zine Expansive slash Expensive Selfies to gesture towards the spaces that Gehun and Moore create and inhabit in their photographs, as well as how bringing these photographs from, from an intimate archive to art objects viewed by a larger audience influences them. I was also interested in how Cahun and Moore's work has been labeled as self-portraits and compared to selfies. Selfies or self-portraits allow for a type of trans bodily construction, the ability to portray your own body compared to other forms of photography, such as ID documentation. Um, and so throughout this presentation, I'm going to break down the collages that I made in the zine um, by first presenting the, the portraits that, the like original portraits by Claude Cahun and Marcel Moore and then um, the cuts that I made to them, um, and then building the collages throughout the presentation. Um, so throughout this process of collaging and writing, I was considering questions such as, how does the resurrection of Claude Cajon as a lesbian artist, and then as a trans artist, contradict their work claiming and rejecting masks? How does the collaborative authorship of Cajon and Moore complicate labeling Cajon as a lesbian or trans artist? How do the versions of a self or body accumulated in Cahun and Moore's work reject and claim each identity presented in the photographs? Sorry. And so I wanted to start the zine um, with this quote 
It's only when we resign ourselves to necessary partialities that we can allow for our masks mold to set, um, which is from disavowals. Okay. Um, and I wanted to use this portrait um, of Cahun and um, Cahun and the use the mask from the portrait, which is parallel to Cahun's face, um, kind of to signal this visual metaphor. Um, in both their artworks and writings, Cahun and Moore use masks as a metaphor for the centralized versions of a self that are presented to be understood as an identity. Photography is used to create these masks by centralizing a body to a flat surface that we expect to represent the whole self. The masks presented in the photographs are not only true versions of Cahun and Moore, but also fabricated or failed representations. Um, and I use this image of Cahun's body as an example of how the artist flattens Cahun's face and body. By holding the mask to their face, Cahun is also showing their own hand in the construction of this version of a body. Um, throughout these photographs, there's al also an interaction, uh, uh, sorry, an inter erotic interaction in care based on the construction of gender and self. Cahun posing as different genders or identities and more staging and documenting them forms an erotic exchange between the couple through the intimate collaboration to explore gender itself. This exchange claims aspect of gender identity as well as sexuality in the same moment. The photographs have been labeled as Cahun self-portraits by art historians because they were not titled as part of the artist's private archive. However, Moore's involvement is present throughout the photographs, either visually or by documentation. I chose um, this image to include in the collage because of Moore's visual trace. Their shadow overlaps Cahun's body and entangles Moore not only in the photograph, but in Cahun's self, or in this representation of their body at least. Um, I used the whole photograph without cutting it or altering it um, in the collage because of the intricate space that Moore's shadow and Cahun's body create against the flowers behind them. Um, and so the photographs that Cahun and Moore took, including the still lifes and portraits, create deep spaces and flat surfaces. I want to include this quote also from Disavowals um, because it reflects the circular composition of this photograph and the artist's inhabitation of different identities in their archive of photographs. I collaged this still life because it defines and explores a gendered space and motion. The gendered items of clothing invoke a spiraling motion by their placement down the staircase. The staircase not only becomes a place of movement, but a decorated body. Queer identities hold space for gender non-conforming expressions, and many trans people move between these identities to inhabit gender. So Claude Cahun and Marcel Moore both claim and reject aspects of lesbian and non-binary identity in their work. These contradictions become a dimensional space rather than flattening a self into a single image. Um, and I want to use these two portraits in the same collage um, because I feel like they use this same kind of play between flattening with the mirror um, and their image and also kind of like entangling the couple and this sense of self. So these contradictions do not invalidate Cahun and Moore as a trans or a lesbian icon, but rather highlight commonalities between. There is often an overlap in trans masculinity and lesbian butch identities, which are put in contradiction to each other. I'm a man, not a butch lesbian. I'm a masculine woman, not a man. These divisions are often in contradiction to my own experiences of moving between a butch lesbian and non-binary trans identity. There's often an overlapping experience of butch lesbian relationships to masculinity and trans masculinity. Um, and I wanted to use this um, photo in particular in the collage because I feel like it really emphasizes the play between clothing, um, layering and like fabric that they use throughout the portraits. Um, so, and so there's often an unrecognized space of being both butch and trans and somewhat neither. Butchitists and transness sometimes feel the same and sometimes feel like opposites. Um, and so I included this, this part of the image um, in the collages because of how um, Cahun uses 
and more use lighting in this photograph to really like show the dimensionality or flattening effects that like photography can have on the body um, and kind of like inhabiting this trans aesthetic like through using these forms to flatten their chest. Um, and so this is the one of the final versions of the collage that is in the zine. Um, and I just wanna pause for a moment um, and enjoy this photograph because I feel like there's a lot of playfulness throughout their archive. Um, and this is a good example of that. Okay, so I'm gonna just start wrapping it all up. Um, the lighting and staging emphasizes spaces and dimensions within the photographs while also flattening Cahun's body. By playing with the dimensions of the photograph, photographs, Cahun performs a mask and exposes the flattening effect of constructed performances of gender. The depth of the visual space in Cahun and Moore's portraits is highlighted by the intricate spaces contrasted to the flat planes created through clothing, masks, and shadows. Documenting the dimension and flatness of individual aspects of identities allows for Cahun and Moore to move between labels such as trans or queer while also claiming and disavowing them. Cahun and Moore can be trans, lesbian, t for t and anything else we can read or take from these images at the same time. They will also contradict these identities through the portraits in this archive. Um, thank you so much. And I just wanna introduce Crystal Ellington who is up next um, presenting. Hi, my name is Crystal Ellington, and today I'm going to be discussing with you my senior capstone called The Radical Project. But first, I would like to sing a song and share a sentiment that some people may have. Don't touch my hair Cause it's the feelings I wear Don't touch my crown They say it's the vision I found and they don't understand what it means to me where we choose to go where we've been to know and they don't understand what it means to me where we choose to go where we've been to know Okay, so the reason I shared that song with you all is because Solange is basically saying and singing in that song that it's not just hair. And I'm here to tell you the same thing. It's not just hair, especially for a Black women. So my project aims to understand the significance of contemporary Black hairstyles and hair care on a personal, social level. In historical level. The project begins with me on a personal level. Two years in on my natural hair journey after years of excessive heat straightening and damage from partial weaves and braids. I was finally feeling more confident to wear my hair naturally but I kind of wanted different styles other than buns and afro puffs. I just wanted to explore a little bit more. And I also wanted some more techniques and hair care tips on how to care for my hair in this type of state. So I got help from YouTube, but I really wanted help from the woman in my family besides the woman on screen. I wondered why couldn't I really go to the woman in my family for hair care tips? In a sense, I was asking, 
Why was the cultural knowledge of black hair care in my family and in my community consisting more of straightening styles rather than natural hairstyles? And why did that seem to be the case for my friends as well as other black women within the African diaspora and America? Like most scholars, to answer this question, I took the historical approach and I learned some pretty interesting facts. One of those facts was that slave traders shaved the heads of their captives. Now, this seemingly simple action wasn't all that simple. It was way more complex because in African societies, hair wasn't just hair. Hair was a language. It could communicate many things, such as marital status, age, religion, ethnic identity, wealth, and even your surname. And for some, hair was even considered to be divine. Now this was because hair was the utmost thing on the body. It was believed that gods could communicate through the strands of the hair into the brain and into the soul. Now, because the soul contained the individual, the hairdresser was held in the highest regards and was considered the most trustworthy individual in some societies. Clearly, hair was very intricate in the fabric of African life. Whether it was intentional or not to shave captives' heads, I agree with hair historians Ayana Bird and Lori L. Tharps. The act of shaving one's head was the first step towards cultural erasure and an altered sense of the black self in one's hair. But the steps did not end here. Slaves worked 12 to 15 hours a day, seven days a week. So that meant little time for hair maintenance or passing down cultural knowledge such as general upkeep of one's body or their hair. Additionally, Racial inferiority was pushed onto slaves by calling their hair wool, even if their texture was similar to that of their enslaver. One former slave whose father was the plantation owner's eldest son recalls, and I quote, Mistress used to ask me what that was I had on my head and I would say hair. And she said, no, that ain't hair, that's wool. I had straight hair and my mistress would say, don't say hair, say wool. If this racial inferiority was internalized, it would be passed on from generation to generation. Another step would be the adoption of white hairstyles due to working inside of slave owners' homes, as well as being tasked to style their own hair. Now these relations would further the dynamics of hair and body politics. For some, recreating hairstyles was actually a mockery of power relations. For others, it was a way of economic and social freedom. This was because race had transformed from the anthropological perspective of being environmental to being purely physical. After learning this, I realized that the lack of knowledge that the woman in my family had on proper hair care or natural hair care was actually due to the slave trade and probably an attempt for me to just get ahead in life. I also realized that all of these relationships actually help create the variety of hairstyles that I have now to choose from, from jerry curls to heat straightening my hair to even wearing wigs. My research also made me consider how caring for natural hair and knowing how to care for natural hair is actually a systemic issue, especially if you're a college student. Since I was curious about others' thoughts on hair, hair care, and identity, I decided to host natural hair care workshops at school. These sessions are called the Radical Project Workshop. They begin during the fall 2019 semester, and besides hearing other perspectives on hair, the goal for the sessions were to actually see how hair affects identity as well as social interaction while creating a physical community to remedy the loss of hair knowledge. 
I also sought to remedy the financial issue of having to buy hair care products as a college student by asking for a mini grant and actually getting a mini grant from our civic engagement and social injustice group at the new school. Each week, participants discuss a theme related to hair, hair care, and blackness. Sessions are recorded and generally the format is check-ins and open discussion, then an activity, then a closing. Outside the workshop, participants sign up for interviews with me to share their hair stories as well as their favorite styles. By the end of the project, I hope to have a live website that features the audio from the interviews as well as videos of hairstyling and some thought-provoking articles. With this project, I hope to showcase how hair isn't just hair for Black women, but that is personal, social, and historically significant. Like Salam says, it's a way to communicate our feelings and our beliefs and love for our bodies. And if you really think about it, hair is a language. It speaks for my ancestors, our innovators, and of course, myself. Thank you. Hey, uh, my name is Eric, and today I'm going to be presenting a short film that I made about a semester ago. Preceding my enrollment at the new school, I strongly desired a spot in USC screenwriting program, which is a 4% acceptance rate. And should I have made the cut, I presume I would have networked alongside my many stereotypical filmmaking peers. The film bro, who, in introducing himself to the class, would say Tarantino's a god and that his favorite film is Pulp Fiction. Or the girl who cuts her own wispy bangs uh, and had an A24 internship prior to her enrollment. And she like edits all of her films into a 4-3 aspect ratio, but in post-production. Okay, truthfully, as much as I do love to hate her, I kind of wish in some ways that I was her. Um, but nonetheless, I was rejected by the USC administration and became sort of stagnant in my writing endeavors, particularly after having spent two months writing on their requiring of seven supplemental materials. And one of which uh, asked me to describe an experience that made me the individual that I was today. You know, one of those prompts. Um, I wrote a short story entitled The Guest Room, and it was a story about a room in my childhood home. It's the room that I'm in right now. Um, a room with a door leading to the backyard. It was perfect for sneaking out. A room with its own bathroom. A room with its own lock. It was the trap room made for endless nights of getting high with my suburban friends. And it was the room that begged for trouble. Uh, a room that was passed down from my sister to my brother, and then to me, all of us having lived our high school years inside of it. And it was it's, it's a room that sanctioned freedom and, and privacy and comfort until it didn't. My sister was sexually abused in that room by her boyfriend of the time in 2011, and she was a sophomore in high school. In my possession of the room, and during the summer before my senior year of high school, um, a best friend of mine had come to visit me. He was a boy that I had loved in ways that my closeted self couldn't really understand. And he was the first boy I ever came out to, a straight one, mind you. The first boy to sleep beside me, hold me in ways other boys wouldn't, and uh, the first boy that made me feel good about the parts of myself that no one else uh, yet had or validated. And after having spent the day with our mutual friends and getting way too stoned, he came home with me, as he always did. And um, in my sleep, he attempted to have sex with me. And I woke up to unwelcomed hands in my pants and to two endless hours of unconsented groping. And I stayed silent, and I, I became silence. Uh, it was like a newfound tension. A boy that I had once desired physically and emotionally had now become my abuser, and it was a boy that I never imagined was capable. 
And sexual abuse is ambiguity. It doesn't look or feel any certain way. It is a collectively individual experience, and I'm reminded of that every time I return home, every time I'm returned to this room and I sleep in this bed. And before the Dean's Honor Symposium, I had no intentions of sharing this piece publicly. It didn't even have a title. I didn't know how to associate my experience, how to compartmentalize it or to call it. And it's neither entirely good nor bad. It's it's nameless and it's silent. And in navigating how to reflect on an experience like this, one that has hindered me of trusting potential partners or engaging in sexual intimacy and love, something I know I deeply desire, um, and would be good at, I've discovered that talking about it renders no answer. I mean, after enduring the assault, pretending to be asleep, waking up and staring into the eyes of a boy who'd known he'd done wrong, it was the silence that became the loudest sound. And it was enough of an answer. Silence is the loudest sound, and that is what I have chosen to call my movie. Um, even though... My teachers encouraged me to submit it to festivals. I felt so uncomfortable and shameful watching my film. Uh, weary people wouldn't get it, um, as if there's something to get. And ironically, after forcing myself to take part in the symposium, I have found greater meaning in my piece and its entire production process. I made a film about the ambiguities of sexual abuse, uh, more rightly put, about the relationship between an individual's endurance of sexual abuse within a particular space. For me, for my sister, it's our bedroom, this bedroom, and now when we share and live in that space together during family reunions, having known it differently in different times, I can't help but think about how she must feel every time she returns to it too. It's the casualness, the subtlety, the boundarylessness, and the lack of knowing one is worthy of consent that renders sexual abuse as insidiously ambiguous. And the new school has provided a space for me to explore my trauma and struggle with the ambiguities of sexual assault and the spaces in which they occur. And in retrospect, I am thankful I didn't get into USC because making a film about my sexual trauma cost enough. <laughs> And uh, on a last note, uh, if at any point you feel uncomfortable or triggered by the images or actions on screen, uh, please feel free to step away if you need to.
lost my toe? Because I called you fat. I didn't mean to cut it off. It was an accident. That's why for an entire year people called me Sir limps a lot I'm sorry. It wasn't your whole toe. Yeah, well, I missed the tip. It's the best part. It has the nail. A lot. I came up with that. <laughs> what? Nothing. I said. I said you're so great, and then I just. I just stopped talking. <laughs> you said you loved me. I can't believe it. No, I didn't. <laughs> yes, you did. No, I didn't. <laughs> you love me. No, I'm not. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it!
Hi there, I'm Emma Jones, and welcome to my Dean's Honor Symposium presentation. Thank you to everyone on livestream for watching, and to all of my panel members, Liv, Crystal, Eric, and Art, for the vulnerable and thought-provoking work they're sharing with everyone, even across these platforms that are a little confusing to use, and in these times that are deeply difficult and confusing as well. I hope the symposium can be a way for the Lang community to be together and unite behind a bunch of interesting research that we've all worked really hard on. I'll be talking to you today about my research on the French second wave feminist thinker Monique Fatigue and my process translating her novel Le Corps Lesbien from French to English for a contemporary audience. So I want to begin with the quote I got the title of my presentation, to bring the real body violently to life from, that touches on this panel's theme of body language. Fatigue wrote, the body of the text subsumes all the words of the female body. Le corps lesbien attempts to achieve the affirmation of its reality. To recite one's own body, to recite the body of the other, is to recite the words of which the book is made up. The fascination for writing the never previously written and the fascination for the unattained body proceed from the same desire, the desire to bring the real body violently to life in the words of the book, everything that is written exists, the desire to do violence by writing to the language which I can only enter by force. And that's from the essay, The Straight Mind. Much of what Vitique's work covers is the deconstruction of language and how identity presents itself in the makeup of language. In French, the pronoun je derives from a masculine noun, and thus, whenever Vitigue writes je in Le Corps Lesbien, she puts a slash to the j and the e as a way of subverting the presentation of the language and showing how inhospitable the grammar structure of French is to women. Le Corps Lesbien is not quite a novel. Published in 1973, a reviewer once described its theme as lesbians invading each other's body in an act of love. Its only mainstream translation is by David LeVay, a male surgeon, which felt wrong to me as it's a text about the lack of language for women's experiences themselves. So why is a man translating that? So I figured I speak French, I could translate it myself. Certainly other academics have worked on this project, most notably Namaskar Shaktini, but Vitigue's work remains on the sidelines of contemporary academia and is somewhat relegated to niche corners of queer studies and women's studies. I was so drawn in to Le Corps Lesbien because it resonated with me on a personal level for a reason that might initially seem unrelated. I lived for a very long time with a chronic pain condition called pelvic floor dysfunction, which manifested as spasms in my pelvic floor muscles, in other words, the muscles around the vagina. The rabbit hole of medical testing and clinical language around sexuality and sex organs that I fell into gave me an incredible amount of insight into my own experience of sexuality, but was also incredibly isolating. Many women with pelvic pain experience unconventional orgasms or are unable to have penetrative intercourse at all. The only academic article I could find on pelvic floor dysfunction that was not a medical statistic was Amy Kaler's Unreal Women, a study of the sexual experience of women with vulvodynia, another form of chronic pelvic pain, and how pelvic pain affected their perceptions of their womanhood. As well as my translation, I have written an academic article on the link between pelvic floor dysfunction and Vitique's writing, wherein I worked in Kaler's research on pelvic floor disorders and my own personal experience. Chronic pain is a very rarely discussed corner of disability studies, and looking at Vitique's work through the lens of that discipline provides a necessary link between disabled and queer existence as well. Translation as a practice is the act of trying to bridge two things which are not necessarily compatible, a lot of Vitique's writing hinges on the French-specific grammar that point that all objects are gendered, and it was difficult to apply that to English, which doesn't have that in its grammatical makeup. But that idea about translation can be extended to experience as well. I may not be able to make any of you entirely understand the experience of living with pelvic floor dysfunction. By becoming aware of its existence through language, I have at least made some connection, however imperfect. This is simply to provide a visual for the work that I've been doing and to give you a sense of the format Le Corps Lesbienne is in that straddles poetry and prose. 
I understand it's likely difficult to read via the live stream format, but I wanted to show that there are both subtle and significant changes between Fatigue's original, my work, and LeVay's work. I'm going to zero in on a few. Here you can see that in Vitigue's original French, she used the word sans pouvoir. Quite literally, this translates to without ability. However, pouvoir also comes from the same root word as the English word power, and can alternatively be translated as power. I found this interesting in the context I was approaching Le Corps Lesbien from in my academic paper, and the disability studies theorist Robert McRuer has an excellent essay called Compulsory Able-Bodiedness and Queer-Disabled Existence, which provoked a lot of thought in me about ability, access, and power structure. I wanted to preserve that reading, so I decided that powerless was better than without being able to keep the double entendre in French and the honoring the root word. I don't imagine any of you have heard the word cyprine before, unless you happen to be a French doctor. It's a French word for vaginal discharge that is very rarely used outside of a medical or clinical context. You can probably understand why it rubbed me the wrong way that Levey translated this as juice. There's an odd sexualization there which seems to defeat the purpose of a text that is trying to decenter men's experiences from language. I tried the word discharge as a replacement, but realized that wasn't that was used another time in the text more directly, and eventually, after reading Namaskar Shakti's very specific defense of preserving the word cyprine, I decided to leave it as it was. Vitigue uses the word maîtresse, which, as French masculine and feminine nouns often do, translates most literally as female master. In English, the words master and mistress feel less directly connected than maître and maîtresse, and I again felt there was something strange and fetishistic in Levé's choice to supplement Fatigue's words with mistress. I wanted to choose something that felt more neutral, because Fatigue's writing is meant to acclimate the reader to feminine experience being the neutral as opposed to the masculine. Since English doesn't have feminine, feminine and masculine nouns, this was a challenging choice, but I went with my love because of the possessive pronouns connotation of power structure that preserves what maîtresse was going for while avoiding sounding clunky in English. I hope that through my research I can show a wider understanding of chronic pain and the sexuality of chronically ill people through not niche medicine but rather through art and language. I was fascinated by this text from the beginning, how it head-on acknowledges the power dynamic and violence inherent to love and intimacy, and the beauty of the language in, the, in Vitigue's writing. Though it's definitely not a light beach read, if you do check it out, I can promise it won't be like anything else you've ever read before. A thank you to my professor in my freshman year Poetry of Resistance class, Miller Oberman, for supporting me in my project and introducing me to Monique Vitigue. Again, a thank you to everyone on the symposium panel with me and to our faculty advisor, Pacho Velez, for their friendship and support both during this stressful time globally and regarding my project. I'd like to personally thank Prim Bicea, Jillian Bolnick, Frankie Ackerman, and Lucas Weiss. And of course, finally, a big thank you to everyone listening. We'll be continuing with a presentation by Art Lahara. Hi everyone. If you're still tuning into all of this despite the chaos that's been happening in the world, uh, I really appreciate it. I'm sure it means a lot to me and my panelists because we've been working on these projects for a very long time and they're important to us. Um, obviously this presentation has had to be reworked a little bit uh, from how it was originally meant to be presented in person, but um, we're gonna make it work, so just stick with me. If we had been in person, I would have started by asking um, what do you think Americans spend the most money on? And if you're watching, you can just sort of answer that question in your brain, but I'll tell you that uh, while I was doing test runs of this, uh, I sort of got similar answers, more or less. Um, often people would say things like rent, which I think is really true, especially here in New York City, where $1,500 a month for a studio is a steal. Um, or food, which I also think is very uh, true, considering the fact that if you've ever been to like the Whole Foods on 14th Street right by our school, you know that like you can't go in there and spend less than like $20 uh, or 100 if you're trying to get groceries. Um, so yeah, so there, there are things that come to mind when we think of what we spend money on. But I think that one of the things that doesn't really come to mind when we think about that is death. Death is expensive. Death is 
the third largest expenditure after a house and car in the life of an ordinary American family. And this might sound like a surprising statistic, and if it's surprising to you, you're probably not the only one. Uh, I think the funeral industry is something that's often not discussed because death is considered such a morbid and private topic and people don't really want to be honest about it. It's one of those taboo things. Um, but I don't think that it has to be that way, and I think that what I found while writing this paper and working on this project and what I hope you'll find at the end of this presentation is that by treating death in this way where we can't talk about it, um, we've created a society in which we are being taken advantage of as consumers. I am obviously not the first person who has noticed this and who has wanted to work um, or to do research and work in relation to this. The leading work on this topic is Jessica Mitford. She pulled back the curtain on the funeral industry with her book The American Way of Death in 1963, and a revisited version of the book with updated statistics was published posthumously in 1998. Uh, I sort of like to joke around and call this presentation the American Way of Death Re-Revisited because what I wanted to do in my project is take her books and update her statistics for our modern day now in 2020 or when I did this project, like 2018. Um, so how did we get here? How did we get to the place where funerals have become such an expensive thing. Well, the thing is, funerals didn't used to be expensive. There was a time, a very, very long time ago, when the largest funeral expense was alcohol. Uh, this really started to change with the Civil War and the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution increased the standard of living. Status displays became popular, and this extended even to death. Leaders in the funeral industry echoed this belief, um, the sort of, like, prevailing belief of uh, wanting to show off your newly acquired wealth by saying that in keeping with our high standard of living, there should be an equally high standard of dying. The Civil War, on the other hand, provided plenty of dead to display and rediscovered the technique of embalming. Embalming is something you might have heard of before. It's how sarcophagi were well, bodies for sarcophagi were preserved in ancient Egypt. Bodies needed to be embalmed during the war so that they could be transported to where they actually were going to be buried. And it's due to this practice that becoming so widespread that the profession of the undertaker was able to come into its own. The profession of the undertaker is crucial to understanding why the funeral industry has become so expensive because of the fact that the role of the undertaker becoming something that's been professionalized is something that is often used to justify the higher funeral cost and the undertaker service fee and all that because they that's what funerals do now. They're, they market themselves as providing a service. Embalming is also really important because it became so widespread that many people believe it's still required for hygiene reasons. Um, this is despite a ruling by the Federal Trade Commission in 1994 claiming that funeral directors could not lie to the public about what is and is not required in funeral services. This idea that embalming is required has become so widespread that the damage has been done, and often funeral directors don't even have to lie because people just assume that it's something that has to happen. Uh, embalming has also taken center stage because of the idea of the open casket funeral. The funeral industry has sold us on the idea of the beautiful memory picture of one last look at the dead uh, in this sort of like beautiful form uh, without any of the pain, without any of the trauma from dying, just this, this, this preserved body that almost looks alive. Uh, but this idea is a uniquely American one, and I want to stress that because 68% of funerals in the mid-1990s here in America were open casket, uh, but that's not how it is in the world at large. Um, this idea of the body, of something that the funeral director sells to us, of something that is, we have to witness, like, families have to witness the body um, one last time in order to tr feel like real closure is something that funeral directors and the funeral industry capitalizes on. Jessica Mitford in her book quotes John Crocious by saying, if embalming is taken out of the funeral, then viewing the body will also be lost. If the body is taken out of the funeral, then what does the funeral director have to sell? And sell is what the funeral industry does. In 1963, the funeral industry was a $1.6 billion industry. Uh, and Jessica Mitford sort of like 
messes with that math and includes some things that were obviously being left out in the original calculations and rounds it up to being a $2 billion industry, um, which means that we were spending an average of $1,450 per adult funeral. Um, in the 1960, in, in the 1960s, that amount, $1,450, is was more than what was being spent on personal higher education expenses, the cost of providing medical care for the elderly, and what the federal government was spending on conservation. It was higher than all three of those things, among some other things, combined. Uh, which meant, effectively, that we were spending more on the dead than the living. Uh, and the cost of funerals have only continued to increase. Um, the National Funeral Directors Association has a website where they provide a national median cost of funerals every year. You can go on their website, you can look at their statistics, it's what I did for this paper. Um, and they provide a national median cost of funerals every year and specify that it does not include cemetery, cemetery monument or marker costs, or miscellaneous cash advance charges such as for flowers for an obit obituary. So. It kind of makes you wonder what it does include, but it does include things like the average price, the median price of a casket, and the service fee, and all of that. So it's the numbers that I used. And what you can see here is that for 2017, their median cost of a funeral with viewing and burial was $7,360. I just want to let that sink in for a minute. $7,360. Their total cost with a vault, which is something that is also not required by law, but is often required by like the specific cemetery that you're choosing to bury the casket in, uh, is $8,755. These prices, of course, are for a traditional funeral, and people are becoming less and less keen on the idea of a traditional funeral. There's no shortage of articles on the internet questioning the future of funerals and talking about the latest innovations in methods of body disposition, burying your ashes along, along with or under a tree, shooting them into space, turning them into diamonds. I'm getting my ashes turned into a record when I die, um, and my partner is on board with this and knows that it's my last wish, so that's just sort of what I'm thinking about. One of the most well-known alternatives to burial is cremation, and while one might assume that cremation is cheaper, the funeral industry has gone to lengths to ensure that it won't be. Uh, what are these lengths? Well, basically the funeral industry tries as much as possible to sell you a cremation with service, which is basically a funeral with all of its trimmings just as an adjunct to cremation. Uh, uh, there are cases of funeral directors renting caskets for short viewings at $600 to $800, and then all the funeral director has to do is replace the interior between uses, um, which costs him less than $100, so he can make a tidy profit. Um, there's uh, instances of funeral homes dissuading the family from scattering ashes and advertising uh, the purchase of a niche instead, or charging $1 to $200 for a sea scattering and then paying the pilot an average of $30 to $60, so basically, like, the pilot is paid 30 to $60 to scatter a bunch of ashes at sea, the funeral industry uh, charges one to $200, the funeral home charges one to $200, they make a profit. Um, meanwhile, casket manufacturers went all in on the production of luxury urns at wholesale prices, ranging from 70 to five, $575, which translates to a much more expensive price for the customer making his or her selection in the undertaking parlor. In addition to this, when looking at the complications of cremation, we have to look at the legal complications. 39 states have ready to embalm laws which require all firms selling any type of funeral service to have embalming preparation rooms and all funeral directors to be trained as embalmers. This increases the price of burials overall because that cost of the extra schooling gets passed on to the consumer. It also increases the rates of embalming because if someone went to school to learn to embalm, you can bet they're going to counsel families to choose that as the as what they want for their deceased loved one. Um, overall, when it comes to crem cremations, this kind of commercialization and, compli and these kinds of commercializations and complications add up. Uh, if you look at the statistics on the Nat National Funeral Directors Association's website, you'll see that the median cost for a funeral with viewing and cremation in 2017 was $6,260. That's basically around well, the exact number is $1,100 cheaper than a funeral with burial, or a difference of $2,495 considering the vault, which means you're basically only saving on the casket. So what can be done? What can we do about this? What, 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 what does this knowledge, what can you do with this knowledge that would make listening to this presentation worthwhile?
Well, I think the most important thing, and I saved this for the end of the presentation because it's what I really want people to take away from it, I think the most important thing is to know your rights. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in 1994, the Federal Trade Commission created something that is called the Funeral Rule, which is basically a list of regulations um, that were meant to sort of crack down on some of the injustices in the funeral home industry. And a lot of people don't know that the funeral ro rule exists. Um, so here I am telling you that the funeral rule exists. The funeral rule makes it so that funeral directors can't lie to you, but that doesn't mean they won't try. So here are a few things to keep in mind. First, embalming is not legally required in any state. Funeral home, uh, second, funeral homes are required to provide you an itemized list of prices. And third, no state or local law requires the use of a casket for cremation. Those are three very big things to remember. Um, Caitlin Doty, who runs a YouTube channel called Ask a Mortician, also explains that knowing your rights is especially important in the case of direct cremation. Direct cremation is uh, barring sort of like strange things like give, like li like giving your body to the government uh, to use after you die um, for scientific testing. Uh, direct cremation is the cheapest way to dispose of a body after death. It is the cheapest funeral method that exists. Um, but you have to know how to ask for it. Um, because according to the Funeral Consumers Alliance, 23% of funeral homes don't even tell consumers about direct cremation options. Uh, when you're calling a funeral home, you these sort of, this thing to keep in mind is to say, direct the is to ask for the price of direct cremation all inclusive the importance of the phrase all inclusive is stressed as it ensures that the price you are being told includes all fees and that they won't pop up as separate charges later uh the prices on this method can vary usually from 700 to 1200 dollars although there are funeral homes that charge up to three thousand dollars for it which caitlin doty and i agree is a ripoff for the sake of the length of this presentation, that's about as much as I can say on the topic of rights. That being said, I want to leave off with a silver lining. Green burials are becoming more and more popular, and as they do, the funeral industry is increasingly in a position where they will be forced to innovate or die out. That being said, knowing our rights is essential, and I hope this presentation makes that clear. Funeral homes should exist to provide a necessary service, not to take advantage of families in their most vulnerable moments. Thank you all again from the bottom of my heart for tuning in. This concludes our panels, and we'll be transitioning now to a live Q&A. We're all muted and we should all probably stop being muted now, guys. Uh, and <laughs> Hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for, um, for, for watching the presentations. Uh, very quickly also, um, I'd like to, um, on behalf of the entire group, say thank you to Stephanie Browner and thank you to Jennifer Regal, who really made uh, the presentations today possible. Um, so um, <laughs> thank you, Leo. <laughs> um, so um, I think that the, the way to get started here is that I, I will start by um, um, asking some of the questions that you've posed during the presentations to the, uh, to the panelists. Um, so let me go back to the top of the conversation. And Liv, maybe we'll start um, with uh, with Dominic's. Um, sorry, with Gloria's uh, question to you, Gloria O's question um, about other artists that you think are using concepts of masks to ask the questions that you raised. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, Gloria. <laughs> um, so I was thinking about this. I don't have a great answer to this question. Um, there's a lot of, um, so artists like Cindy Sherman um, are often like put in dialogue with Cahun's work. Um, Cahun kind of as a precursor to Sherman's work, um, kind of using this, this idea of becoming another person or putting on a mask somehow to become another person. Um, and then Jill Jillian Wearing is a artist who recently kind of recreated all of Cahun's work um, and using their specific 
um, sorry, using their specific uh, photographs to recreate um, and like really interrogating the idea of a mask. Um, I feel like it's, it's hard to answer because you could almost apply it, you could apply it to a lot of different artists. Um, I was thinking as I was making this and collaging with their images a lot about um, trans um, collaging practices and like trans zines um, that I found through the um, the queer zine archive project, um, which archives a lot of zines. Um, and, and there's this like a reoccurring theme kind of of these collage together bodies um, and faces um, that kind of use this like mask-like feature um, that also talk a lot about like trans community making alongside these. So that was like really influential to my own like, aesthetics um, and just considerations of their work, but yeah. So, so that's the, it's kind of like the artist I was thinking of during this project. Cool. Thank you, Liv. Um, this is a question that Orville uh, posed originally for Crystal, but I think it's a, it's a good question for the entire group. Um, um, yeah, if you discovered anything during your project that surprised you or that was unexpected. Um, I guess I'll start off. I would say the most surprising thing I found out um, about during my project would be the different opinions people have on hair because I had my own opinion. I thought everybody had the same opinion as I did. And honestly, that's not the case. So that's kind of like why I said at the beginning, hair is personal. Um, and generally anything to do about like the body or even languages that we speak, like it is personal as well as like communal. So that was the most unexpected thing that I had. Would anyone else like to answer that as well? Sure. Um... For me, uh, I would say that uh, the most challenging thing was the actual process of making it. Um, I, don't, I feel like a lot of people don't, I think, I think the process of filmmaking is heavily undermined by like the end image itself. And you know, a lot of the time people are only taking away what they've experienced on screen, but they don't understand like the actual process behind shooting it. And this was like the first real project that I ever, went full force on and really shot um, and thought all about continuity and made a whole shot list and you know all got all these props and got all this equipment and did all this stuff and I did it with only two other people um, my friends McKay and Carlos um, so we were just like a three people crew and um, it just really made me appreciate um, the the process behind filmmaking relative to just like the image that you see on screen at the end. And that was, I think, like the biggest struggle that I discovered lugging like pound, 80 pounds of equipment from the new school to Washington Heights for like three days on and the MTA it was insane. <laughs> I think mine was just kind of a surprise from start to finish. Like it was sort of one of those things where like I went, I went into it being like, oh, I know this is, this industry is 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 messed up. I know that there are aspects of it that are predatory. And it was just like at every sort of at every turn, it was so much worse than I could have imagined. Um, and, and I guess that's kind of why I I sort of like I didn't expect to end the project with the sort of like know your rights uh advocacy piece, but it sort of ended up being very central to the the whole thing for me because I I I was infuriated while I was doing my research. I was very, very angry at the fact that people are being taken advantage of in what is probably like one of the most vulnerable moments. Um, I can answer as well. I, I think honestly, the thing that I learned the most is sort of a more practical thing, which is that translation is really hard. Like it's something that takes a lot of sort of rote mental work, especially when you're dealing with something as dense as the text that I was working with. It's something that really takes a lot of brain power. And not that I didn't understand that before, but that I didn't really appreciate the amount of time that you can spend just sort of staring into a text and getting really, really absorbed in it. And like hours could just go by and you're like, wow, I really have spent like two hours trying to figure out what this one word would be in English. So it's something that, uh, yeah, that doesn't seem obvious when you look at a finished product of a thing like that. 
Nice. Yeah. Um, so I think like one of the more surprising things that I was doing or that I encountered while researching um, Cahun and Moore's work was kind of the emphasis on their biography um, rather than um, their like individual artworks that I encountered um, and kind of the circulation of Cahun's images just paired with like their biography um, and how that like in my mind contradicted kind of what they were writing about and um, how their like identity has been written about um, especially recently, um, and like all of these like kind of like articles and like news publications about them. Yeah. Um, uh, the next question is uh, one, let's take one for Emma. Um, uh, a few people asked uh, if you'd be interested uh, to say more about the choice uh, of the translation of I for uh, je uh, uh, slash e. J slash E. Yeah, totally. Can everyone hear me okay, Dan? We're good? Okay, yeah, but uh, so that was definitely a choice that wasn't immediately obvious to me. I really didn't feel like there was a good way to translate the je with the slash in it into English because I is a one letter word in English and the way Levey did it was just to italicize it and that just like looked ugly to me from a formatting perspective and just it didn't seem to work with the text and so I gave it a lot of thought and Honestly, the reason that I came to that is because I had a like very serious eye surgery when I was really young. And that's a lot of the reason that I have like musculature problems now is because one side of my body is like sort of out of alignment with the other one and needed to be corrected. Like one of my eyes was higher up. And so I needed to have a like medical thing to correct that. And so I've always been really fascinated by the concept of eyes and vision in literature, like I've worn glasses my whole life. I have abysmal vision. And so it's something that I very closely identify with. And I was like, that might be kind of interesting as a like way to approach that. And so I just sort of threw that in there and I ended up really liking the way it looked visually. I like the fact that uh, the Y between the, the e two E's kind of mirrors the visual presentation of je with the slash through it. That, I don't know, it's sort of like, semiotically looks like the the slash and has almost a kind of like phallic connotation between the two letters and like in translating a text like this you have to deal with a lot of the visual stuff as well as the like literal meaning and I felt like that was better than just doing the italicized I and it was also like an like interesting thing to have people ask me about like it's a like thought-provoking choice and I think that that's always a like good thing to have in your work is to have something that people will have questions about and will like push them to read forward, read forward and talk to you more about it. Thank you. Um, Eric, there was also a question about um, the, the work of sound design in your film. Yes. Um, Maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, about the- Yeah, um, a lot of, uh, um, when we were filming, we didn't roll too much sound if we didn't need it. So a lot of it was sound development. Um, a lot of it was Foley work, um, all of the breaths, all of like the, you know, the boots, all of like the minor sounds um, were done afterwards. Um, and then I took a lot of like, uh, Jonah is the guy who played the guy in it. Um, uh, I sat down with him and we did like a lot of weird uh, breathing sounds this like one afternoon. Um, and I just took them into Adobe Audition, I think is what it's called. And I messed around a bunch with so much sound, um, putting so many different effects on it, like messing with like, I don't even know the technical terms, but, like the wave length, I don't even know, just like all this sciencey looking math stuff, graph stuff, looking at a bunch of tutorials on distorting audio. Um, so I did a lot of that and uh, everything else was just kind of like, you know, making sound louder, making sound less loud um, because it was all taken at different moments in time. And even now I don't think it's as cohesive as I would like it to be. Um, I wish everything was like kind of seemed like a little more on the same level, but I'm so happy where it's at. And it just was basically like a week of me sitting um, in Arnold Hall's eighth floor computer lab and just like messing with audio for hours on end. <laughs> um. 
Pacha, I think uh, you're on you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you're actually telling a, a sort of a, a funny anecdote about when we first heard the video as well. Um, in oh, the, like in, in our in our in the, the first time yeah. this. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, it's just like completely no audio, and I just think it's so funny. Um, we have like a little, I mean, we're all here on Zoom, all of us and all, all of my fellow panelists are here telling me like, oh my God, it sounds so much better with the audio. Like I actually got way more out of it now. And I'm like, well, that's the point because the first time it didn't happen and I was kind of freaking out um, about if anyone would like actually enjoy it or get it to the extent that they could. And it was just an awful experience having to like watch this very vulnerable thing that I made just like with no sound. So it just like didn't really make any sense at all. But um, I'm happy that it's now. Now you can all hear it. I'm happy. Thank you. <laughs> and just, I mean, just for me and I think for the group, the experience of seeing it um, in, in a situation where we really couldn't hear it and then seeing it in a situation where we the sound is very present uh, really points to the the ways in which the sound design sort of fundamentally changes the uh, the meaning and impact of the piece. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask another question uh, to Crystal. Uh, this one is from Hannah Griffslevin. And apologies all if I'm getting your name slightly wrong. Um, Crystal, uh, did you share these hairstyles with your family? Uh, have they changed their hairstyles from straightening it to appreciating the curl and working on some of the styles you discovered? Okay, can everyone hear me? Am I good? Okay, so I actually did not really share a lot of these hairstyles that you saw in the um, video with my family, but um, I think my dad saw um, one when I was doing a little slides and his reaction was like, wow, that's so cool. Um, but when it comes to the women in my family, uh, I haven't really fully had that conversation yet, but um, from the pictures that I see, I kind of, I kind of don't know if I really need to have that conversation because, like I said, hair is personal. Like for my mom and like the era of, I guess like the asymmetrical hairdos. <laughs> like I think that's just so cool and so characteristic um, of the of the era of where you know how she grew up so no I really haven't um had that conversation um about them embracing their hair I would say but I feel like they embrace it in their own way like mm -hmm. there are even some times where I'm just like oh I wish I could just dye my hair pink like tomorrow I I plan on like dyeing my hair blue so that's totally different <laughs> Um, and how have the how have the sessions been going? How have the I mean I guess I guess it's uh, until until the uh, until the interruption. Um, the sessions have been really interesting uh, since this whole I'm going to call it a break <laughs> um, on Zoom. <laughs> it it's been kind of challenging because you have to be engaging, but at the same time, I feel as though that it feels kind of natural because, you know, people FaceTime nowadays. So like we're just having our little conversations. It's like a group so far with like us doing hair within the space. Um, we haven't really been able to do that, but since we're all home um, and there's like the new craze on Instagram about the, I think it's called the don't rush challenge. So we're all deciding that we're gonna do the don't rush challenge and we're gonna upload it and then I'm gonna edit it. And I feel like it's gonna be like really cool to do our hair all at one time on Zoom and like get ready together like we're going somewhere, but you know, we're just staying in our house, so. Mm -hmm. Becomes its own uh, goal. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and so this is a question, I'm gonna ask another one. Uh, this is a question for Adrian. Uh, it's coming from James uh, first. Um, how do you answer the complicated response that some of us would rather pay someone whatever they charge so as not have to deal with funeral arrangements in our time of grief? Yeah, no, I, I saw that question actually and I thought it was a really good question. I've been thinking about it for like the past 10 minutes. Um, and I think it's really complicated because I think to some extent there is the matter of affording like I don't want my the goal of my presentation was not to say that like lavish funerals shouldn't exist I think obviously like there are people who want that for themselves and there are people who have like planned their funerals um there are a lot of people I know and I sort of came across this in my uh the class where I worked on this project death and mourning and religion where we 
saw cases of people who planned their funerals down to like the very last detail. Like they picked their own casket while they were alive. And of course there's like a budgeting aspect to that. I think that a lot of my concern and my frustration in my presentation is the fact that I've run across in my personal life examples of people um, within my own family or outside of my family who could not afford a funeral and who did not know that there was a cheaper option for funerals. Um, like the sort of idea that like, oh, like I have to take a loan in order to make this happen, but like it's, it's, this is normal is something that I very much wanted to sort of disrupt because I, it's not normal and it shouldn't be normal and no one should be going into debt to bury a loved one. That, that was sort of my concern. Um, <laughs> Sorry, um, uh, Jim, I just I just saw what you, I'm, I'm looking at the comments and I just saw what you said. I mean, if you wanna spend thousands of dollars on your own funeral, it's up to you, um, more power to you, but I want everyone to know that they don't have to do that and that it shouldn't be normalized in culture to do that as well. Um, and there's a follow-up that we just received for, for Crystal as well. Um, uh, where did your narrators learn their hairstyles from? Was it from a beauty salon visit or looking at fashion magazines or where? Um, I've had some people learn, I would say from fashion magazines or going to the salon, I would definitely say that uh, for some individuals, it is like their mother actually like, you know, doing hair or whatnot. So it's, it's definitely different and it depends on the person. Mm -hmm. I would say for me, like part of it would be my mom and my sister. Um, learning how to do hair and then you know because I'm in the era of YouTube so YouTube tutorials gotta try different things out. <laughs> <laughs> nice. um, and this is maybe a, a question for the the entire group obviously you you all conceived of this your, your project ideas uh, separately before you before you'd met um, uh, and once we sort of decided on this this broader framework of of body language, how did uh, how did that concept uh, sh help to sort of shape or or hinder um, the development of your your individual research? I guess I can uh, begin to answer that. Something that really fascinated me in our panel was how, and I believe we talked about this like when we were initially trying to come up with the name, the fact that all of our presentations dealt with different things with the body, but in incredibly different contexts. Like mine has a lot to do with sex and a lot to do with like sensuality and like physical pleasure. Whereas Eric's approaches sex and physicality from the complete opposite standpoint of like the the opposite of pleasure and sort of violation and invasion. And then arts has to do with death, which is a bodily experience that's like another sort of like foil to the idea of sexuality because death is the opposite of procreative, it like ends something. And then I feel like Liv's and Crystal's both deal very much with like aesthetics and presentation of both of these ideas. And this is like a not totally formed thought that I literally just have now, but like, I feel like every part of physical presentation and every part of aesthetics is some combination of like sex and death and those two ideas sort of working against and with each other. Like, I think those are the two sort of most primal physical experiences. And if language is trying to do anything, I think it has to do with those concepts. I'm going to say something a lot less profound than what you just said, which is <laughs> that I just came to the realization that all of our projects I feel have to do with like some sense of marginalization um, that I hadn't thought about. Like all of these like bodily topics that people don't want to talk about. Like people don't like talking about like the intersection of like sex and disability. People don't like talking about sexual assault. People don't like talking about like the way black women are treated in America and how that extends to like their hair. People don't like talking about like the existence of like trans and um, and queer figures uh, in art. And I, I feel like all our presentations sort of like have this spin to them where they wanted to like talk about these things and they wanted to bring these things to light. Um, and I know that's what I was trying to do in my presentation um, because I say it right at the gate, like people don't like talking about death. 
And so I don't know, I just realized that that's sort of an interesting way in which all of our presentations fit together and I kind of wanted to highlight it. Yeah, I'll say piggybacking off of that, that, that's basically kind of saying that we've all been like silenced in some kind of way and that we haven't got the chance to speak about our bodies in the way that we would like to speak about our bodies sometimes or that is misunderstood. Um, so that's that's what I'll say. Liberated. Um, <laughs> yep. I think once we like met and kind of talked through this this idea for the panel, um, I think like my idea of like what maybe a mask is um, kind of shifted a bit and kind of thinking in this this way that Emma Emma talked about with, with presentation as language um, definitely like influenced how I thought of of masks for my own projects um, in this language through like creation or just presentation. Eric, you want to take us out or you're, you're good? I, I don't really, <laughs> um, I don't know. I agree with everything they've, they've said. What I think is really interesting is just how kind of back going, piggybacking what you said about uh, Crystal, uh, a way in which that our bodies have been silenced and this is kind of like now we've been given a platform to like talk about this which I'm so grateful for what I think is so interesting is that we all had these individual experiences um but that they just like have a way to connect to each other when they're like so completely not like each other and um I think if it's if it's done anything for me now it's just like teach me how to body language way better um mm -hmm. in a way and just be more aware of body language because i feel like when uh human interaction is going on and you know if you uh use sexual assault or just like kind of weird sexual vibes as the scenario like your brain is being racked and there's you're so consumed by so many thoughts and like it's sometimes it's so hard to take note that like body language is really the key thing and like you will get everything you need to know out of somebody's body language it's like the same thing on screen you don't need words to understand that two people are uncomfortable or that two people are very comfortable when the body language is just like very there and it's very present um, and i think i just i'm really grateful for that that's corny but <laughs> but it uh, also uh, addresses the present moment in a certain way i mean one of the things that zoom yeah. really saps is is your body language, your ability to communicate with your body and your ability to read other people's bodies. Um, uh, uh, so, I'm sorry, I'm seeing that the stream is broken. Yes, I just uh, want to make sure before we continue because I, I froze up for a lot of people. So. Okay, let's give it one sec. Yeah, I don't, it's frozen on a frame for of some reason for of Eric's film for me, <laughs> and that was like a long time ago. Heyo. <laughs> yeah. As well. Okay. Oh yeah, I'm seeing Eric's film. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry you guys keep having to watch. No, it's all good. It's a great. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like Eric's film with no audio though. So. Yeah, it depends on it. So basically, the first time we watched it. Again. <laughs> All right, I think we're back. I think we're back. <laughs> yeah, all right. The dance, I keep going. Yeah. Um, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> gotta, gotta push on through it. Technical. Uh, okay, it looks like, oh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm still watching Eric, so I don't know about you guys. Uh, oh, yeah. We have a couple questions here. We have, let's, let's tackle, let's, um, let's tackle Leo's question. Or sorry, actually, we have, we have one question from Cindy, uh, Cindy Bari. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, this is for you, Art. Um, what do you think about using GoFundMe for funerals? <laughs> I think the fact that people have, like, there are people in this world who have to use GoFundMe for their funerals is evidence of the fact that we have a problem with the funeral industry. <laughs> like, that's that's the best way I can say it. Like, I think the fact that, and and to be fair, I think that that can applies to a lot, especially here in America. Like, people use GoFundMe to fund their medical expenses there's that there's that story it's 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 dark but it's, it's it's the truth i remember that new story about that man who died because his gofund like he couldn't raise enough money for insulin on his gofundme and i think that that's the same problem of the fact that like if people are using gofund like 
death, like being like dying should not be a luxury. It happens to everyone. Like that's, that's the best way I can put it. Like that, like dying should not have to be a luxury. Like a funeral should not have to be something that is only available to people who can pay for it. Um, and I think that the fact that the funeral industry has become a game of profit rather than providing a necessary service is disgusting. So that, that's, that's mostly what I can say about the fact that people, like the thing of using GoFundMe for funerals, like the fact that people have to do that proves that there's something <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Um, we have a question from Leo, uh, Leo Goldsmith for Eric. Um, can you talk a little bit about the painting at the end of your film uh, and what you think about the creative, uh, the creative process's role in helping or even hindering the process of working through trauma? Um, first, hi, Leo. Um, mm -hmm. And I could go one of two ways, the creative process of like, me or the person who made the the painting for the film or the like the character herself like painting in the film um i guess uh i'll i guess they're kind of like one and the same as if like madeline a fisher who played the the girl in it uh as as kind of me in a way um uh i think of it <laughs> As a creative process, I think it like helps working through trauma. I think like making this film has helped me work through trauma because a lot of it is about, like Crystal said, um, like a way we've all silenced our bodies. So to have a way to externalize that silence um, and through a way that's not language and through a way that maybe doesn't have to be so literal and you know, people can kind of take what they want away from it, from the painting, from this film, uh, whatever it may be, whatever creative process, whatever the creative process is, whatever you're making, um, I think is really beautiful. And um, cause I'll be honest, that painting had absolutely nothing to do with how I feel about <laughs> sexual <laughs> abuse. I'm pretty sure that um, it was like my friend, Corey, I like, she's a pretty good painter. I haven't painted in so long. So I was like, hey, can you just start like working on this? And so she just like started painting a little bit and then I took it and then I started painting and then another friend of mine started painting it. So we all just kind of like put into it. Um, and I, what I think is really funny is how like you thought about the painting of all things in the film um, because I didn't really go into it with much intention and to see that um, it kind of has like a whole new meaning for somebody else, um, you know, juxtaposed against Madeline's character, what she's doing and the end when she's like totally painting over the camera lens, um, which was for me like a way, I, I chose for it to be black because I, I wanted to get a sense that she was kind of like ruining her picture. Um, you know, if that's how she's feeling and that's what she wants her piece to be in that time and place. Um, and who knows, maybe she can, and, and not not having it go any further but maybe like who knows this character will like paint something else on top of this a horrible time and place in, in another time um i hope that answered your question i kind of baffled a bit but <laughs> um uh sorry dan are we are we on or off right now um uh i just don't know if the, we're up great okay perfect um and I have uh, another another question um, that is um, is for the group. Um, obviously, this was this was not how we imagined uh, capping capping your research. Um, and I'd like to know a little bit more about your plans for uh, continuing the work or or uh, other other spaces that you might like to present the work in. Um, and in general, sort of how you, yeah, how you sort of see this work, um, how you see yourself continuing to um, present this work to the world. I'll go first and now I'm unmuted. <laughs> um, I feel like this actually links to um, another question by Victoria Ellington. She asked me, how do we bridge the gap of knowledge and accessibility to products and styles? Um, and for me, after doing this project, I really kind of like want to open up, I guess I would say like a salon or a place for a Black woman to actually um, congregate and 
do their hair on more of a communal level and actually learn for each other. Um, so I guess for me, like I'm looking into like maybe starting a nonprofit or starting a business as well as actually continuing interviewing women about their hair and their stories. Uh, because I would just say as individuals, like we grow and evolve and we believe in one thing this day, another thing the next. Um, and I think it's really important to actually like document those moments and like how we feel and what certain aspects of like our culture means to us. Um, so that way, if somebody actually has a question, let's say in the next 50 or 100 years, like people know um, and we haven't been silent, especially as black women. So. Um, for me, I would say that this piece kind of now serves as like a, a concrete um, form of like the films that I would like to continue making and not necessarily about um, sexual trauma, but just like kind of putting my empathetic lens on it, I guess. Um, and seeing people uh, represented in cinema more correctly to the best of my own abilities. And this was for me just kind of like a big deal just cause it was like the first thing that I really executed um, I tend to like start something and then not finish and then start something and not finish. So um, having this be done and it being almost like a tangible, a watchable thing, um, one serves as a reminder to me that I can continue making other things, but also it's just nice to have a literal thing that I've made now. Um, and as far as getting it out there, I'm not really sure what I, what I want to do with it. I may submit it to festivals, Festivals. Some professors have recommended that, uh, which is so kind, and um, I feel very grateful to hear that feedback. Um, but I'm not too positive yet. But I know that, like now, I just would like to continue making other things that hopefully people can resonate with and identify with. Um, I definitely want to finish the translation because I've translated a bunch of pages, but it's a decently sized book and as a student and also a, I have a job and like all of that. So it's hard to find total time for that. And so I think going forward, I definitely want to finish that. And it would be awesome if I could have a new translation out of the book because it, like I said in my presentation, it kind of saddens me that it's not something that's talked about at all in mainstream academia. And it's I don't know, Fatigue's work is not really w well known at all in the way I think or like Simone de Beauvoir's is. And yeah, I mean, it's kind of unfair to expect everybody to want to read your like niche French feminist philosophy, but like still it, uh, I don't know, it's an interesting thing to have exist. And like, I really don't think the version of it that's like publicly available in English right now does it justice. So I would love it if at one point I could re-release a new translation of it, but I'm that probably has, a lot of bureaucratic hoops to jump through, like involving the estate of the author and like the copyright and all of that. So that's something that I'll cross when I get to it, but it's a nice thing to aspire to. And I don't know, in the meantime, I might submit my paper to some journals like GLQ or something like that. I feel like my project is interesting because kind of like my goal with it is really just kind of a word of mouth thing. Like I will absolutely talk about this to anybody who will listen. Um, like I, it's, it's just sort of like, I, it's knowledge that I want people to know, but I wouldn't know like what platform to go about seeking it. I know that, um, it's interesting because like these morticians like Jessica Mitford and then Caitlin Doty, who I briefly mentioned in my presentation, uh, like she's a YouTuber. Um, and people always ask her, why are you so mean to embalming? And it's, it's like, it's like, it's not easy to criticize the funeral industry. They have big guns. They always kind of want to defend themselves and make themselves seem like they, uh, they they're doing like what's best for people and so I, I wouldn't really know how to get like a massive platform but it's just sort of one of these things where like I tell people like tell your friends about this like tell your family members about this if you have family members who are elderly like make sure that they know this that you know this that everyone knows this because that's really what what matters it's it's the knowledge um yeah awesome really quick um I have been like intending to in this weird like Zoom world that we're in now, um, kind of try and do um, 
uh, like art making um, workshops or activities kind of based on this um, like interaction between um, collages, zine making, um, and just like community building that I've kind of been researching through that. Um, so in the works, maybe next year. I, know, I think we have time for, for one or two more comments. Um, um, does anyone um, maybe want to, I mean, I, I feel like this is a time for a sort of a, a big thought, maybe a little bit of reflection on um, what, what it's like to, um, to, to present work in a virtual space um, not to have the, the body um, in quite the same way, uh, this weird Zoom world, as you just called it, Liv. Um, um, yeah, if anyone has a thought on that. Emma, you're muted. You, you're muted, Emma. <laughs> oh, well, sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just saying, like, to be honest, I was really depressed about the fact that we had to present virtually. Like, I kind of felt awful about it for like up until probably today. Like, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it uh, it definitely wasn't the form that I wanted to be doing this in because I was excited to like invite my like friends and family and everything to a physical event. But like having been here in this space, it is nice to still get to like share this moment with all of you and to like know that even though we're in separate spaces we still have like worked really hard together and like are able to appreciate each other's work and I don't know I guess there could be some like large philosophical takeaway about the like fact that emotions and experiences do kind of transcend like physical space a lot of the time like I don't know that's something that I deal with in the idea of being a writer or a poet or a translator that like how can you take something out of its physical presence and put it into sort of an like emotional space where no matter where you are, you'll be able to appreciate it for what it is. I feel like, I don't know, like my sort of experience with this was just, I was very scared. And this this doesn't even apply just to this class, it applies to all of my classes. Like I was really scared that after the extended break and just like all of this that's been happening that like no one was going to care anymore and no one was going to show up and no one was going to take anything seriously and just the fact that like and I felt this like the first time that we had our zoom meeting afterwards when we were trying to figure out how to make this work just the fact that all of you like came here and you wanted to make this work and we I feel like we all just put so much work into making these presentations like adapt it adapt to a uh, di like digital sense like I learned video editing for this so like I I don't know I just I feel like it just meant a lot to me that everyone in this class um in this section cared so much about this and still wanted to get these messages out just by our, our lack of a physical space um and then I guess just as like a funny little anecdote I don't know I guess this like means a lot to me because like all of my like I, I my partners and my uh and my friends and my parents like have tuned into this and like they're like sitting in the living room right now like listening to me even though I'm in my bedroom and I don't know it's funny and it's weird but it, it, means, it means a lot to me yes. well that might be a great great place to end it so thank you all thank you for participating Thank you to everybody uh, out there watching and um, yeah, we're signing out. Okay, thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.